Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Bingham, Sustainability and Accounting Manager, A4S. Thank you for joining the webinar today on Access Finance Enhancing Investor Engagement. There's been a significant surge of interest in sustainability from investors and analysts, with many increasing their levels of interaction and engagement with corporates to improve reporting and work towards more comparable and transparent communication. In today's session, we're going to explore the current investor landscape and focus of investor relations teams, in addition to the principles and practices of engaging with investors on sustainability. Please note, we are recording the webinar and it will be made available on our A4S YouTube channel afterwards. The A4S webinars are held monthly and they're open to everyone. So please do have a look at the follow-up resources email that we're going to send out afterwards for all our upcoming webinars and please share these with your peers and your colleagues. The email will also include information about our academy program, which you or your colleagues may be interested in joining. So the agenda for today, we're going to start with a discussion from our panelists to explore examples of how to enhance engagement between corporates and investors on sustainability matters. This will be followed by a Q&A from the audience. We'll then have a brief introduction to the A4S Enhancing Investor Engagement Guide. Um, we'll finish with a wrap up. So you can ask questions freely in the chat function throughout the webinar, and we will try and address these as part of our Q&A later. We'll also be asking questions about the content covered throughout the webinar using Zoom polls, which you will need to complete in order to get CPD and CPE points. And to cover our learning objectives, so after completing today's webinar, you're going to be able to describe the guiding principles and current practices of engaging investors on sustainability, summarize the current investor landscape and focus areas of investor relations teams, and hopefully translate the experience and learning of others from practical examples shared during the webinar to your own work. And you may already be familiar with our A4S Essential Guide to Enhancing Investor Engagement. If not, we'll introduce it later on um, after our panel discussion. But in advance of that, I just want to outline our guiding principles from the guide to set the scene for the discussion today. So firstly, always link to your organizational strategy. Investors want to see sustainability as integrated throughout business and investment processes, and your EI should communicate this clearly. And secondly, provide background context. Why have you selected certain focus areas? The more you can explain why you're focused on specific issues and can quantify their relevance for your business, the more inve effectively investors can respond. And in that context, um, thirdly, we want you to have a long-term focus. Environmental and social factors are likely to be particularly material in the longer term. So putting short-term results in the context of longer-term goals helps to focus the discussion on issues you see as most directly relevant to the business. And you'll also want to adopt a commercial tone with regards to all of this. So linking sustainability to revenue growth, cost reduction, risk management or attention of key key people, and why are sustainability considerations relevant for long-term value creation? You'll want to communicate targets, metrics, and progress. So integrate sustainability throughout all of your communication, not just as a standalone section. And you want to ensure this is a consistent and comparable manner in order for investors to engage and compare. And then finally, use standards. Use recognized standards to report sustainability performance and get external assurance for the key metrics. And with all of that, I'm pleased to introduce today's guest speakers. We have Joe Waddingham, Investor Relations and Corporate Sustainability Lead from British Land, Anna White, ESG Analyst from Fidelity Investments, and finally, Bruce Dugard, Head of Stewardship at Federated Hermes. Many, many thanks to all of our speakers for joining us today and being part of our panel discussion, which is going to be hosted by Helen Wayne, A4S's Senior Manager of Accounting and Sustainability. But before I hand over to Helen, I would like to start with our very first poll to learn a little more about all of our participants here today. So what is your current role? 
and oh good we've got some answers so that's positive that means there are some people here as well um okay so mostly we've got attendees from the finance team which is really excellent most of A4S's materials are really geared up for specifically the finance team but also we've got a good range of investor relations as well and um, as well as a small amount of other I obviously don't know who you are but this will completely hopefully engage with what we've got to deliver to you today and you'll be able to understand and take away those objectives that we've already talked about. So we're now going to move on to the next section, the Q&A with our panellists, and I'll hand over to Helen, who's going to provide a very brief introduction. Thanks, Jessica, and many thanks again to our speakers for joining us today. I have great pleasure, pleasure in introducing our guests who will provide us with their insights into enhancing investor engagement. So first, um, we'd like to speak with Joe Wadgingham, who's Investor Relations and Corporate Sustainability Lead at British Land. British Land is a leading UK property company with a portfolio of high quality commercial property focused on London campuses and retail and fulfillment assets. Their purpose is to create and manage outstanding places which deliver positive outcomes for all stakeholders on a long term and sustainable basis. Joe's Investor Relations and Corporate Sustainability Lead and drives the interaction with analysts and investors to shape British Land's sustainability strategy. So Joe, um, at A4S, we've seen a, a big surge of interest recently from the investor and analyst communities, as largely as a result of increasing awareness of how sustainability um, issues can impact organizational value. At British Land, have you seen kind of an increase in the expectations of investors and analysts? And if so, how are you meeting these requirements? Um, hi, hi, Helen. Um, yes, we have, and I would, I would say that sustainability has been um, on the agenda for, for a number of our investors for some years. And um, we have a, a lot of Dutch pension funds, for example, who have always been quite active in this space. Um, but that's but now but now it's definitely on everyone's agenda. Um, I think regulatory change like TCFD has has been part of what's driven that. But in real estate, I think there is a there's definitely a growing appreciation that sustainability considerations do go straight to value. I think this is an area that we we probably led. We we had, we'd kind of led this dialogue, but we, we brought investors along with us, and um, that's really because we felt that we had a competitive advantage in um, delivering more sustainable space. And what we find is that occupiers actually want more sustainable space. They they the the um, credentials of a building matter to them. They want to reduce their own carbon footprint. So actually delivering more sustainable buildings means we get better rents we um, and it means we can we can let our buildings quicker um, one one thing which we have um, introduced which has gone down particularly well with investors is we set up a transition vehicle um, this is ring fence funds which we are using to improve the sustainability credentials of our buildings and that's financed by a an internal carbon levy of 60 pounds per tonne of carbon in our new buildings. And this, this is just an example of something that we've done, which has gone down very well with investors as a very practical way of addressing something that, that they see as an issue um, and, and goes to improving the value of our buildings. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it's, it's um, good to know that kind of the quant quantity of the carbon price that you use, because there's such a big range in practice at the moment. So it's yeah, useful yeah, to understand. I mean, we, we set that a couple of years ago and it was in line with the London plan. Actually, we'll, we'll assess that every year. So I suspect that was something that will increase over time. And in terms of British land sustainability strategy, how, how important would you say the role of um, investors and analysts is, is drive, in driving management's attention to kind of strategy enhancements um, and kind of the related commitments? Yeah, I think it's the, the the fact that there's so much interest in this is definitely means we can go, um, we can move faster on this. Um, I thought it might be interesting to just um, talk through a quick case study um, that, that's been really, really, really important to us in the, in the last couple of months. So EPCs, which are the energy performance certificates of a building, and it's a measure of their energy efficiency, have become something of a focal point in, um, in real estate in the last sort of six or 12 months. Um, and that is because by 2030, um, all buildings will need to have an A or B rating in order to be let out. At the moment, about 30% of our portfolio um, meets that criteria. And that, that's the same for, for all of our peers, but it's something that will increase over time. Um, 
but uh, some time ago, an analyst put out a note suggesting it would cost us more than 700 million to, to fix that and we might have to suspend the dividend. Um, and this is clearly, you know, that was clearly a, a material concern for us. It, it's not the case and we, you know, we engaged with them and they, 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 they amended their note. Um, but it really, it really does flag that, um, that sustainability things go straight to value. And as a result of that, we and, and a lot of our peers have actually put out um, estimates of what, of what it will cost us to, to retrofit our portfolio. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's much, much less than, than they expected. But we are now tracking EPCs and we've elevated that as part of our strategy in a way that we, we, we hadn't done um, prior to that. I mean, it would have always been part of our approach but we've, because it's, it's such an easy to understand metric and it's so easy to demonstrate progress against that, that's now become much more of a, a kind of central point for us. That's really interesting. So kind of meeting a direct question and doing modeling around it to understand yeah. the impact on the organization. Yeah. Um, and in terms of effective communication with investment investors, obviously it's kind of really important for the relevant teams to be equipped with the knowledge and skills and the, to be able to provide that relevant data to be able to kind of participate in dialogue around sustainability issues. How do you ensure within British land that there is that kind of appropriate expertise to be able to have those organisations, um, those dialogues? Um, I think, well, one, one important point of context, I think, is that everyone on our EXCO has a sustainability objective, and these are cascaded throughout the organisation. So as e for each EXCO member, there they will have, there'll be a number of like sub objectives which are handed down to their team so everyone is directly incentivized um, to make sustainability like a part of their business um, and that's that's really focused people's minds on it um, to to actually in terms of sort of learning we as a team work very closely alongside the sustainability team so in, in investor relations for example we've actually taken um, sustainability reporting now sits within the investor relations team um, I work very closely with the, the I, I, my background is just pure investor relations, but I now work very closely with um, the sustainability reporting managers. Um, and that's actually, that's become true across the business. So the leasing teams, for example, work very closely with the sustainability teams because occupiers want to understand more about the sustainability credentials of the building. So we're learning quite a lot just by working alongside the teams, but we are also, we've also invested in training and I did the A4S Academy. Our CFO has done a number of um, A4S courses. I think he did the Cambridge course with you. Um, and we're looking at rolling that out to the board. And on, only yesterday, actually, we, we did a teach in for the board because there is recognition that more people across the business needed, need, need to understand this. Um, I think it's it's also important to note that there's there's a lot of natural interest within the team within the business. So we have a number of employee net led networks um, focusing on particular areas like you know, parents and carers or diversity. And now we have SustainABL, which is a um, a sustainability an employee led sustainability network. And they they posted um, kind of lunch and learn sessions. We've had outside speakers come in. Um, they produce quite a lot of literature which gets circulated you know around the business just giving teaching people how that they can make changes in their own lives but also how they can bring that to their business so I'd say there is you know as well as kind of like the formal training which we're rolling out across the business there is a kind of a ground up movement as well to kind of educate people. Yeah it's really interesting it seems like British Under kind of leading on that um spreading sustainability throughout the organization rather than having it as a kind of a siloed business unit which it may have been in, in the historic yeah. days i think that i mean that our, our intention has always been that sustainability is so integrated that we shouldn't really need sort of specific you know teams i mean i don't not sure we'll get to that point but certainly everybody you know within the business is is very much um on board with it being part of their role thank you very much Joe, for your comments and really interesting to have the discussion today no problem um, so next, I'd like to introduce Anna White, who's ESG analyst, analyst at Fidelity Investments. So Fidelity Investments is a multinational financial services company and one of the largest asset managers in the world. They, they offer investment management, retirement planning, portfolio guidance, brokerage and many other financial products. Anna's ESG analyst and is heavily involved in analysing and rating European companies on their ESG performance, working closely with sustainability leads within businesses to enhance and improve ESG. Hi, Anna. Hi Helen, thank you so much for having me today. 
Our pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us today. Awesome. And so you work quite closely with a lot of corporate sustainability teams and investor relations teams on ESG and the related communications. From your perspective, what would you say that good looks like when it comes to communications on such matters and the related disclosures? So I think I have about four points to make on this. Um, so firstly, I think the more information you can provide, the better. So investors really appreciate transparency. So for example, um, I've been doing some research into uh, CEO compensation. And so I reached out to various companies uh, looking into how ESG plays into that factor. And one company could really go into detail about how it would impact different divisional heads um, and how they measure ESG exactly. Whereas another company um, could only tell me that they would look at ESG metrics, but couldn't provide more detail beyond that. So I think in that situation where you're comparing companies, it's just very helpful if you can provide investors with transparency and, and just a lot of information. Um, and I think secondly, quantitative information is a really good form of communication because a lot of the time ESG analysts or portfolio managers will be comparing companies. And so you can imagine if there's an Excel spreadsheet and that we're comparing different forms of data, um, just the more quantitative information you can give, the better really. Um, and it makes historical analysis a lot easier. And then I think also in terms of good communication, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot today, but materiality is just so key. So um, if your company's making pledges, it's important to show not only why it's the right thing to do, why it's in line with regulation, but also how it impacts your business. Um, and then I think lastly, good communication is all about just knowing what your investors are interested in. ESG is such a broad topic that it's quite, I think it's worth reaching out to your investors and saying, you know, if we're having a one-to-one -one call, what topics would you like to cover? Because, you know, we're not expecting IRs to be able to know everything. Um, so if you can say, get your head of cybersecurity to join the call, or if you have a supply chain expert, have them join the call. Um, and then I think that's a better use of everyone's time. Yeah, it's really interesting that kind of stakeholder dialogue, having the pre-dialogue to kind of be able to manage expectations is quite a useful part of the process. Um, and how do you assess an organisation from a sustainability perspective? So you mentioned kind of direct comparisons on Excel spreadsheets, but do you use kind of other tools or rating agencies to understand an entity's sustainability performance? And um, what do you kind of expect to be publicly communicated through the kind of financial and investor relations functions? So in terms of how um, we assess companies in ESG, absolutely, we look at third pro third party rating providers um, such as MSCI. And it's just very helpful because it's a good sense check. You know, what have I missed about this company potentially or what is consensus thinking about X, Y and Z? So we definitely do look at the rating agencies, but at Fidelity, we're very keen to come up with our own ESG ratings um, and we have our own proprietary system you know, to do that. Um, but it really depends on you know, what industry you're looking at because the material factors will, di will differ based on that. But we use company reports, company one-to-one -one calls are very helpful. Um, and we look a lot at how they're doing in terms of regulation. Are they behind regulation or are they ahead of it? Um, and we compare companies on ESG to each other. We would never rate a company on ESG in absolute. We're thinking of all these different banks, for example, which ones lead on climate reporting and so on. Um, and then a last thing um, is management compensation as well. So how are management being held accountable for their ESG targets? And um, that's very important as well. And do you kind of look for management as well as kind of board level remuneration as, as kind of widening? The... Of course, if, if, if that information is there, then yes, the, the, like I said earlier, the more information, the better. Um, but if companies, you know, are just able to report on how CEOs are paid and whether ESG factors in that, then that's, that's great. Um, if there's more information on the board, then even better. But it's just very helpful for us to know, um, you know, how management really being held accountable for various ESG targets. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And at the moment, what do you see as the biggest kind of gaps in terms of ESG reporting? What do you kind of most often find is missing? So I think companies on the whole, and of course, this is a bit of a generalization, but on the whole, I found that the e-data is really good and it tends to be quite comparable um, and it tends to go back a few years. So on the e-side, I've, I've found that to be very good. But I think perhaps on the s-side, the data can be a bit opaque still. So when it's on topics, such as supply chain or cybersecurity, or looking at um, how your products are safe for consumers. 
Um, on the S side, it does tend to be a little bit opaque. So um, of course, this will depend on what industry you're part of, but um, being able to really articulate that side of things, I think it would be helpful. Um, and then just in terms of ESG reporting, just to make it more standardized, we're really keen to make data comparable across companies so that we can really assess them on that basis. If you can standardize data, perhaps there are different industry initiatives you could be part of where you know you and various peers can agree, okay, this is how we're gonna go about it. Uh, talk to regulators, of course. Um, yeah, more, the more standardized the data is, the better. And that move to standardization is hopefully something that will be kind of improving over the next few years as all of these kind of various bodies comes to together. Uh, many thanks, Anna, for your comments. If, and just as a reminder to the audience, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, then just drop them in the Q&A and we'll try to address, address these after the panel discussion. So next, I'd like to talk to Bruce Stugard, who's Head of Stewardship at Federated Hermes. So Federated Hermes is a global investment manager headquartered in the US. And Bruce is Head of Stewardship within the Equity and Ownership Services and manages a team of engagement professionals delivering responsible investment stewardship services. Their work in gold involves corporate engagement with over a thousand of the world's largest companies across all geographies and sectors. The team focuses on the most material issues driving long-term value for companies and society. As well as overseeing the team of engagement professionals, Bruce leads engagements with environmentally exposed companies across the oil and gas, mining and utility sector. Welcome to the panel, Bruce. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So a large part of your role um, at the moment is engaging with corporates on sustainability, focusing on the most material issues. Where a company is not performing well, what are the type of actions that you might take to kind of work towards improvement or diversification? Well, thank you. And um, I think, uh, as Anna just explained, um, most of our work will be carried out um, through research and then through engagement with companies. So 95% of our interaction with companies will be in a dialogue that's typically one-on-one, -on -one, co confidential, um, collaborative, and wanting to uh, make improvements. And we'll spend more time on the companies where we feel there is uh, more need for change. So mostly it'll be engagement and wanting to understand how a company could, for example, uh, publish more data or take more action. Um, I was interested in what Joanna was saying about how you know, costs were not as high as, as were thought um, in order to retrofit um, and upgrade building qualities. And so that's the kind of discussion that we would like to have um, so that there isn't misunderstanding and we can sort of assure companies that other peers maybe have, have already been through so, some of the barriers that, that others may be thinking about. Um, however, if we're not getting some of the changes that, that we would like to see, then we will begin to take escalated action. Um, I guess that that can come in different forms. Um, sometimes we will go to AGMs, to annual general meetings, and speak um, about a company and the changes it needs to make. Um, we've done that at quite a few of the mining companies, um, utilities, uh, oil and gas in the UK and around Europe, auto companies. Uh, and others. Um, and uh, that's raising the public profile of, 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 of challenges. Um, we can also go further and start to uh, recommend voting against uh, directors. And um, that, that will often be on, on a straightforward issue. Um, I mean, the standard issues have been executive remuneration um, and board diversity. Um, for example, we'd expect um, one third women on the board of a of a FTSE 100 company now, 20% um, on the executive team. Um, and it's great to see this panel is extremely well represented in, in, in diversity terms. Um, and also ethnic diversity. But um, when it comes to um, other sustainability characteristics, we, we are now uh, developing a quite a comprehensive voting policy on uh, climate change. And it, it focuses particularly on laggard companies um, those who have a poor score using the transition pathway initiative uh, score um, below score three um, around the world, or um, those who perform poorly on, on the CA100 um, benchmark, which is the top 167 emitters globally. 
So that may not capture many in the audience here, but um, that's one indicator. And I think this will become increasingly sophisticated as data becomes available. So for example, in the next couple of years, if a company doesn't have a net zero commitment, I think that would be a, a problem and a cause for voting. Um, and then finally, there can be shareholder resolutions as well. So placing down a resolution asking for change to happen. Um, and for example, we've done work at um, BP, um, uh, pass, uh, putting forward a shareholder resolution that then passed and which um, helped to uh, trigger a significant um, uh, action and a change in strategy at, at the company, although um, I, I know they were already planning uh, various ideas uh, as we did that work. It's really interesting to hear the kind of various ways that you get involved in kind of driving change or kind of encouraging change. And one thing you mentioned there was like kind of the role in, of corporates in mitigating climate change and the, the, the step plans such as net zero that organisations need to put in place. Um, I know that the equity ownership services team is planning to kind of further intensify this engagement on climate change. And what do you see in kind of, how do you see this translating into expectations for corporates and the kind of communications that you'll be seeing from their investor relations teams? Yeah, so um, I, I think that the expectations are becoming clearer and clearer um, uh, through benchmark um, uh, measurements and also through published investor expectations. Um, so there are now published by the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change, a range of investor expectations by sector. Um, and we've actually been involved in the drafting of those in a number of cases. So, for example, for financial services um, and how to look at net zero for banking, um, for the automotive companies, for mining, for oil and gas, um, to, to uh, utilities, just to name a handful. Um, so they're all specified. There's also this um, benchmark um, developing, which has criteria across um, a number of dimensions. First of all, net zero commitment, uh, short, medium, and long-term targets, their alignment to the Paris goals, uh, strategy, and then positions on corporate lobbying to just explain that the activity of a company is not actually lo lobbying either directly or through third party associations against the Paris goals. Um, Paris aligned accounts, which is another interesting area where accounts should be displaying the alignment of assumptions to the Paris goals and also good governance, um, things like the connection of executive remuneration. And I think that was one of the British land points that was made earlier. So um, quite a comprehensive suite of indicators that, that show whether a company is, is on track for not only having the aspiration, but delivering net zero. Yeah, and that is the gap that kind of seems to need to be closed, the, the commitment and then the follow up and what companies can tangibly do to kind of demonstrate that commitment, the reduction in emissions. Um, and so the, amongst the wider sustainability considerations, there has been this kind of recent and very sustained focus on climate with kind of COP26 last year and many entities getting to grips with what the climate crisis means for them. What would you say are the kind of next frontiers that investors will be looking to assess and which investor relations teams will need to get to grips with? Um, well, climate has been the really big one um, over the last several years, and, and I think it will continue to be so um, because uh, we keep um, compressing the timeline that there is available to get to uh, anything like um, an acceptable outcome. Um, so um, the, the, the ratchet effect of policy and the need to take action, the availability of technology will all collide to mean even more action by companies over coming years. Um, there is a, a question in debate at the moment, what if we miss 1.5 degrees, if that becomes mathematically almost impossible? Um, I believe it won't really change the, the need for action because the value of marginal abatement of reductions in emissions will only increase as we get to more dangerous levels of climate change. There are other connected areas. Um, biodiversity is a really big one um, at the moment and the uh, impact of land use change in particular and food supply chains on biodiversity. So we have an expectation that companies that have material impacts on landscapes and on, on nature would have a net uh, positive biodiversity commitment and to zero deforestation. 
Um, so that's that's a significant area. Um, and there are also kind of um, uh, related areas to, to climate change, antimicrobial resistance, um, which is uh, rising at the moment, um, cre creates more disease, but it's, it's caused through overuse of antibiotics, uh, particularly in, in, in food production, is another significant area. So th there's other connected areas to climate. Climate still stands uh, as the biggest single issue. Lots for teams to get their heads around as we kind of grapple with what, what these kind of different how to quantify the impact of all of these different kind of risks to business. I think that's right. And materiality is important. So companies will understand their own business models. They need to think, well, what impacts do we really have in the world, especially through our supply chains, and therefore which are the most material for us? And they will vary by sector, by individual business model. Yeah, and that looking out to supply chains point is a really interesting one. And one that I think a lot of companies are also kind of getting to grips with. Mm. kind of understanding not just the business but its impact throughout the kind of globe. Thank you very much for your co um, comments Bruce. Um, if we can turn to the Q&A now so just a reminder for everybody to drop your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we have one for Anna. So what are the leading raters for investors would you say? You mentioned MSCI in a couple earlier but are there any kind of other leading rating agencies that you would kind of go to in the first instance sure so we look at sustainalytics and msci mainly um but beyond that <clears throat> beyond that we don't look at too many rating agencies we definitely try and come up with our own view but um we are keen to see um you know how companies are engaging with the rating providers and giving as much information as possible yeah and no, it, it does seem to be the point that kind of one rating agency doesn't fulfill all of the boxes you have to kind of look at a range of all of them Exactly, because well, at least, at least at Fidelity, you know, we're very much a long-term asset manager. So, you know, we sometimes find that the rating agencies are somewhat back, backward-looking in the data. So, whereas we're thinking in five years' time, will X company improve on these topics? I just to add, I, I I rather support that uh, MSCI and sustainability are kind of standard input feeds for us. Um, but they, um, but they give a good sort of sense check. Uh, I think, as Anna said, you sort of uh, cross check to, to own thinking. Um, we, we do, we always struggle to get really good carbon data from a single source. Um, the carbon disclosure project feeds into Bloomberg, so that's good. But the projections is the, is the complicated part. And, um, and so we tend to rely on individual companies kind of reporting line items, but getting that to be standardized um in, into um a single framework that we can compare and contrast is hard work i expect that, that will improve over time um but uh industry standard metrics and reporting is one thing that we need to see more of and there's been another question just kind of on those forward projections around tcfd reporting this year and how much kind of details expected in the annual report I think the kind of forward-looking projections might be something that is considered in the decarbonisation strategy as part of TCFD. But what else are you kind of expecting to see in terms of improved disclosures this year? No, I could add something on that. Um, I think that on TCFD, the um, the strategy is the most important part um, with the targets associated with the strategy. Um, and we, we'd like to see the more ambitious end of the, of the spectrum of the, uh, the, the targets. Um, I think there's also the scenario analysis um, showing resilience to different scenarios that's really important. Um, and that connects to the idea of um, in the accounts using assumptions that are aligned to strategy and are in line with um, Paris goals. Um, or if not using those, if not using, for example, a Paris lined oil price or um, that then um, showing what the sensitivity test would be on applying um, that, that assumption. So uh, that, that's an area for development um, for many people who, who might be uh, connected to this uh, session today. Yeah, I mean, at, at British Land, this, this is sort of a live debate for us at the moment. We've done our transition and our um, sort of physical risk analysis pieces. Um, but there, there's a sort of question over how much you know how how much we disclose in terms of the you know the quantity 
um, of, of the impact that some of those um, the, the analysis has, has generated. And there's there, there are certainly areas that, that we're very comfortable disclosing because it's actually part of our mainstream, almost part of our mainstream reporting. I mean, the EPC um, point I talked about earlier, but there are other areas that we're, you know, we're still debating at the moment. To be honest. And it does seem that'll be a kind of big debate amongst lots of companies this year is kind of people do get to grips with the more uh, quanti quantifiable aspects of CCFD reporting. Um, and just a kind of general question. So what would you say are the key challenges for ESG reporting for investors and how can these be resolved? Well, for, from a corporate perspective, I, I would probably echo a point that Anna made earlier, actually, about around the social side. I think on the on the environmental side, um, it's much more easy to quantify, um, you know, to set your targets and to demonstrate progress towards them. It's quite hard on the on the social side, and where and, and by that I mean the at British end we think of that more as like the community engagement piece, whereas you know, we can, you know, obviously measure that our gender pay gap, ethnicity pay gap, you know, women on the board, all of those sort of things are measurable, but it's more the, the kind of contribution we made to communities, which is harder to put a value on. And we measure things like the number of people we've supported into employment, um, but that can mean different things to different people. So demonstrating progress in that area is something that we, th we, we think we do it really well and we want to do ourselves justice, but it's quite hard to, um, to measure that. And we're looking at doing things like social value reporting, which a number of people in our sectors do. We don't feel there's a lot of immediate pressure from investors to do that. My, my, from my interactions with analyst investors, I get the impression that they like to see us being very active on that front and to set our own targets and, and to achieve those um, and to have a good narrative around it. Um, but they're not pushing for that at the moment, but I can see that that becoming best practice. Thank you very much for the reply there. And there's just one quite interesting debate topic kind of that's popped up in the Q&A box about um, kind of this, um, the debate between kind of engagement versus diversification and the risk that kind of diversification might just kind of result in companies being taken privately. So kind of more from the investor perspective, but I would expect we talked a bit about engagement before and the importance of it in kind of collaborating with companies. But I wonder if you the kind of Bruce or Annie could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, of course, happy to go first. Um, exactly. We don't want to just invest in large caps that have the funding to do good reporting, etc. We're very keen to engage with companies across all you know, cap spectrums. So um, I think if we can see that a company is willing to change um, and they're putting the right protocols in place. So we've done lots of different engagement on different topics with various companies. Um, and if it helps us gain conviction that, OK, perhaps in the past they were doing something but in future they're improving um, and we are keen to see that engagement but at the end of the day we are serving our shareholders so if companies if we say flag an issue to a company and we have had this in the past and we say for example this accounting doesn't look quite right can you please explain this to us and if the management team don't respond well to that or they can't really give us an answer um, then at that point you know we have to do what's right for our shareholders so it's, it's a tricky balance on the one hand we really do want to engage with companies and we've seen lots of great progress in different areas and that helps build our conviction um, in that area but if companies perhaps aren't willing to engage when we have flagged certain areas then we have to do what's right for our shareholders. Yeah I think I think this is a tricky one because um, institutional investors have high expectations and I guess if a company can find a way to find different investors with lower expectations that, that might seem attractive. Um, I, I think this is where you need to have a mature dialogue with companies and um, be finding that uh, value driven pathway that, um, that that is actually in both the, the investors and the company's interests. That's what we're all really looking for. Um, so there are many different ways to, to have a Paris aligned business model um, and companies that have really been stimulated to think about this have found those um, it's just been getting over that uh, barrier to breaking into that new territory um, so I've been amazed to see you know, the auto companies after many years of, of conversations about having an electric vehicle strategy and getting ahead um, suddenly it's all um, 
you know, we will be fully electric by 2040 and uh, Paris line goals. Um, so it is possible and these changes do happen and investors just tend to be, it is our job to be ahead in, in, in saying where things are going. Um, and uh, I think it's also necessary for companies to set out the dependencies of their strategy. I mean, some of these strategies can only be achieved with good policy. And I think that's a reasonable thing to explain. And not every target will be met myopically, at, um, you know, without the right supporting environment of policy and market developments. So having the aspiration is one thing, delivery, then we have to see if, if that's possible. Thank you so much for all of your questions, top panelists. And, and maybe if we could just finalize, find, or finish the discussion with kind of your top tip to people either starting out on their journey or kind of developing on their journey. And um, if we start with kind of Anna and then Bruce and then Joe to just finish off the panel discussion. Um, well, I think like with any discussion, um, it's always important to say when you don't know or you don't understand something. So I think investors at least really appreciate when IELTS will say, you know what, we don't know the answer to that yet, but we will get back to you. Um, so that sort of level of transparency is really important, I think, particularly when first starting out. Um, and I think, like I said earlier, you know, we're not expecting IELTS to be able to cover everything. So if you're able to get different uh, experts in your business to speak to us, um, we had a fantastic discussion the other day when a company brought their expert on different carbon offsets. That was really helpful. So if you're able to arrange that sort of call, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd very much agree with that, uh, what Anna just said about the right expertise. Um, and I think I'd, I'd um, encourage companies to, to start at the ambitious end and see what's possible um, and, uh, and work backwards from that. Uh, and I think it, it has been good to see the momentum around commitments to net zero for 2050 it's become almost standard but that wasn't the case two or three years ago when so many companies would have wrung their hands and said how impossible it would be so um i i think breakthrough thinking and um and that starts really from the top uh and uh, and, and causing a whole management team to start thinking differently um, I'd, I'd probably say demonstrating a business case. I, th I think that's something that's really helped off if you can show that that sustainability is actually adds value to your business or, or you know, preserves value at least. And I think you, investors are, are always going to be very supportive of, of more ambitious goals. Thank you so much to our panel. It was a really fascinating discussion today. Um, really interesting comments. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Jessica, who will introduce the Enhancing Investor Engagement Guide and our kind of other related materials, which you might want to follow up with after the webinar. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, wow, what a great discussion from our speakers and some really interesting points have been raised. I think we can all agree that um, investors are increasingly interested in organisations that are giving priority to positioning the organisation to drive long term stakeholder value over short term financial gain. And those that apply a purposeful approach to creating positive outcomes and lasting impact for environment and society are getting well ahead. Um, so companies committed to this sense of wider value creation can take advantage of this growing interest by demonstrating to investors how their strategy, governance, business model, and their performance targets and reporting are aligned with wider sustainability principles through enhanced reporting and improved information, disclosure and communication. I think Anna touched quite well on transparency um, and highlighted that there for everybody. So our A4S Essential Guide to Enhancing Investor Engagement provides practical guidance for investor relations teams for effective engagement. The associated maturity map that comes with this can be used to help you assess where you are in your investor relations journey and give you ideas on where you could improve. Um, I think it's really good to know the starting point from where you can then go onwards. So the guide includes detailed guidance and in-depth case studies like the examples we've heard today and interviews with companies, asset owners and asset managers. You're going to receive a link to this guide and our wide AFRESH resources and related relevant resources in the follow-up email after this webinar. 
And please also don't forget to watch out for the details and registration links to our upcoming webinars. Our next one is on engaging the board and executive management, and it's on the 24th of February. So I look forward to seeing you all there. And the content of this webinar will be available for you on our YouTube channel in one week's time. So just before we close, I would like to thank our speakers once more. Today, Joe, Anna and Bruce have really given us a great insight on ways of enhancing investor engagement on sustainability issues. And finally, a final poll, I bet you're all very excited as we close. Um, how will you translate what you've learned in your, the webinar to your work in the next six months? And we'll leave this poll running as we close. So, Read the A4S Essential Guide to Enhance the Investor Engagement. Use the A4S Maturity Map to assess what my organisation is currently doing and how it can advance to a leading position. Talk to my investor relations colleagues about the investor relations practices and activities implemented in my operations and work with my investor relations, finance and sustainability colleagues to review and respond to investor questions about sustainability. Finally, develop enhance the investor relations strategy to ensure effective investor communication and engagement on sustainability. And I can see a really broad range of answers there. So it's really good that people are all having a different takeaway and looking where they can go next. Again, thank you all for your time. And I think it's been a really brilliant discussion. And um, I hope that you all have a really good day or evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much.